I was 12 years old uh, and my mother and I attended a revival. Uh, my mother gets full credit uh, for my faith in Jesus Christ. I was 12 years old when I became a Christian and I was led to the Lord by an associate pastor in the church that I grew up in. Recently found in our family Bible a certificate of baptism showing Sunday November the 5th, 1967. That would have been between my junior and senior year in high school. I was younger than 10 years old when I felt the love and the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I followed him, I accepted him. Later in my teen years, I dedicated my life to Christian service at the call of a pastor's sermon. A lot of people have helped me uh, grow as a disciple. Uh, first would be my mother. Uh, Second would be uh, my first boss, a farmer, Gene Bowman. And then uh, Master Sergeant Keith Prentice, who I worked for when I came back from Vietnam. I worked for a lot of great military leaders that uh, reinforce values to do the hard right versus the easy wrong, do unto others as you do unto you. A lot of similarity in Christian values and military values. I've had many teachers over the years that have helped me grow as a disciple, some in Morningside and some outside of Morningside. First of all, my mother was instrumental in making sure that I attended church services and I have a deep uh, indebtedness to her to making sure that we remain faithful through that effort. Um, in the Sunday School Arena, Rick Alexander was our first teacher for me as an adult when I married my wife, Georgie. It was our first couples class, my first adult class. I'd like to mention three events that helped me to grow spiritually. As a young woman, I admired the women at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, specifically wives of faculty and wives of staff. They exhibited spiritual fruits as found in Galatians 5, verse 22. Also on two mission trips, I was able to attend with strong Christian women and men. I examined further my faith and my life. Such examinated, examination helped me in this mission venture. After coming to Morningside, I have grown spiritually in Bible study. I had always devoted the Sunday school hour to practicing for the worship hour. But now spiritual growth is coming through Bible study in a group and I'm also enjoying personally studying the Bible on my own. What I see the Morningside family doing is uh, growing, uh, and I say that uh, because of my experience with my Bible fellowship class. Uh, I have three amazing Bible fellowship teachers that are truly biblical scholars, and they really help me understand the Word of God. and. Uh, the, uh, the warmth of our church, the welcomeness, uh, our children's ministry. Uh, I see nothing but uh, great success for our church in the future. I think Morningside is on the cusp of doing great things. I think God is present in Morningside and is using the people of Morningside to do great things for His kingdom. Historically, Morningside is a very family-focused, friendly uh, church and congregation and we're continuing in that legacy and I expect really, really good things to, to surface here after we conclude the pandemic. I anticipate great growth. As we gather together and know the tenets of our faith and then spread these within the community, we will be able to bring the love of God to the unsaved, to those who are lost and bring them into our church where they can feel the love of Christians here in worship and in study of our Bible. Now you should know that none of those people's, uh, people were actors and none of them were paid uh, to give such glowing reports on, on, on Morningside. And, and, you know, two of them even had swag. You know, you saw the Morningside Baptist logo on Bob Jordan, um, the Morningside men, and then, and then Rick Stallings had the Morningside logo uh, that, that we had designed. And then, and then um, Butch Wheeler had a Hyundai uh, logo on his shirt. So, so, so go out and buy a car uh, and come to church at the same time. And, and then, of course, my mother-in-law, uh, again, no, no, you know, 
Credit is due to my mother-in-law, that she is in this church and that my father-in-law are in this church. We had nothing to, well, okay, their daughter may have had something to do with the fact that they're here in this church, but we're so glad that you're here today, and, and especially for those of you who are in mourning after yesterday's events. <clears throat> Look, I, I, I'm probably not going to really go there much because I was told when I moved down here to SEC Central that there were some controversies, you know, and, and I've experienced some of that myself. Um, you know, I'm an SEC uh, fan, being a Kentucky fan, <clears throat> undefeated. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, look, being an undefeated team, I know there's a lot of pressure on undefeated teams, you know, to do, to do right and so to do well. And so I'm not going to really say anything. Um, look, with the, with the Alabama mafia just across the river, I'm not going to do anything to say anything to trouble anybody about any games that may have been played and lost yesterday. As Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. So I, I'm staying away from that. All right, now, with that being said, I love the fact that we can have a little fun on Sunday morning, but I also love the fact that when you come in here this morning, on a Sunday morning, you are about the glory of God through Jesus Christ. And we've sung all about Jesus Christ today. And Jesus was the one who said, I will build my church. I'm going to do it. And he has been doing it. it and, and you see the evidence. So each of these stories, and so, thank, so many thanks to, um, to Matt and to Phil who helped put these videos together. You have seen the evidence in every single story of how God has worked through people to build people as a part of his church. This is why we wanted you to hear these stories, these testimonies of God's work in individual lives, and, and you've heard it. And, and you are a story if you know Christ. If, if, you're, if you're a part of his body, then you are also a testimony, a story of how Jesus is building his church. You are his church. So you are the evidence, each of you, that Christ is building his church. We tend to think of churches as places. And, and yeah, okay, so this is a place, and we gather for worship here. But, but in Scripture, the place is where the people of God are gathered to seek God, to grow in their faith, to worship. And you don't need a building for that. You just need a name, right? And Jesus said, you know, you only need two or three to gather in my name, and I am in that place with them. And so he is at work in us, building in us as we gather together to seek him, to grow, to worship, to care, and then today to work as one. In a lot of the uh, purpose books that you find out there, um, in, the, in the Christian world, uh, there, are, there are lots of great outlines of what the New Testament commands believers to do, whether they call them marks or, or if a church is purpose-driven or not. And, and what, I, what I note is all of these things are, are wonderful and biblical, and you can break it down in different ways, what the New Testament teaches about what the church should be doing. But when we look at what, um, what, what Christ how he describes his church and how he describes the work of the church, the mission of the church, he's very often talking about how we cannot accomplish the mission of God, the work of God, the kingdom of God will not go forward when we are separated, when we are divided, when we are at cross purposes with one another. And so, um, as I read the New Testament, and really I, all, all, the, all the Scripture, the people of God advance when they are one. And they, they step back, they retreat when they are not one. Now, unity is not the most important value in the church. Jesus is the most important value in the church. But then Paul says, is Christ divided? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because see, there in Corinth, what had happened was, you got people saying, yeah, I'm with Peter. Oh, I'm with Paul. I'm with Apollos. And, and, and Paul goes, hey, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean you're with this person or that person or another? Is Christ divided? 
And the reason Corinth was having so many problems is they had taken their eyes off of Christ and had put their eyes on lesser things. And, and that's how we end up going different directions. Now, I've chosen a text today, and all of these, by the way, all, all, all of the messages in this series are, are either taken from Matthew or Luke. And the reason I did that is because I'm in this broader uh, series in the Gospel of Mark that we're going to come back to starting next week. And so I didn't want to go from Mark. I didn't want to pilfer from a sermon down the road. And I wanted to stay uh, not so much out of the book of John, but I wanted to stay with these other two synoptics, the other two guys that are saying, and then Jesus did this, and then Jesus did this, and then Jesus did this, and then the cross, right? And so John is a little bit different. So back and forth, Matthew, Luke, Matthew, Luke, and the teaching specifically of Jesus for this series. And we could go anywhere in the Bible to talk about how God will build his people up. But today I've chosen a text that may not, may not scream at you unity, may not scream at you uh, the people of God need to be one. But, but don't worry, we'll, we'll get there. So this is in Luke chapter 8. I referenced this text um, during our series, The Fam, back in the spring. I didn't preach it, but I did reference it several times. And so Jesus, at the end of a long extended teaching uh, uh, message, sermon, right? He's given several parables. He concludes what he has to say with these three verses. So this is Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 19. Luke chapter 8, verse 19. Jesus has just te taught, he's just uh, taught the, the people. And then it says, now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near to him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Very simple. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. My church works as one. So the question is, just briefly, how many words of God are there? How many, how many words of God are there? Well, you could say two. There's the written word and there's the Word made flesh, right? The written Word, the Bible, is authoritative for the Christian life. And then as the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 1, uh, the first three verses, at times in various uh, times in the past, God has spoken to us through prophets. But here more recently, God has spoken to us through His Son, the perfect image of the Father, right? John calls uh, Jesus the Word of God, made flesh. Not the Bible with skin on. <laughs> no. Jesus is not the Bible. Jesus is God's ultimate declaration to human beings. You want to know who I am? Jesus. So, but, but, but are these opposed? The written word and the word made flesh? Of course not. They're not opposed. One points to God and the other goes, and here I am. <laughs> yes. So, so in, the, in a sense, we could say that though there is a written word and, a, and a, an enfleshed word, there is one word of God. Jesus says, those who hear the word of God and do it, which is why Jesus can come along and say, blessed are you those of you who hear these words of mine and put them into practice, Matthew chapter 7, for you will be like a person who built his house on a rock, not like the sand, but on the rock. So Jesus says, if you hear my word and you do it, you'll be blessed. You'll be happy. Well, and it makes sense because he is speaking for, and in fact, is the declaration in himself of Almighty God. But then the question is, of course, well, how many gods are there? How many gods are there? The gods of the nations are many. There's lots of them, right? But we find out in Scripture, but they're not really gods at all. They didn't create anything. They don't answer prayers. 
They don't come and save us from death and hell and the grave. No, no, all they manage to do is lead us away from who? The one true God. Yes? No idolaters in here, I'm assuming. So one God and one word. So how many directions do you think we will be going when you and I together seek the one true God and follow his one word. How many directions do you think we'll end up going? How many are we going as Christians, right? Whoa, well, that's another question altogether. <clears throat> but what Jesus is saying here is that all of the people in the world who hear the one God speak and then do what the one God has said in his one revealed word written and enfleshed, they are his one family. Those people, wherever they are, wherever in the world, as they take the word of God, receive it, and then put it into practice in their lives, they are his one family. This is what Jesus is saying. You and I make up Team Jesus. Team Jesus. That's who we are. It's football season. Why not use a team metaphor, right? And we say, hey, there's no I in team, but there's no U in team either. And if you rearrange the letters, you can't get a me, <laughs> which would sort of defeat the purpose. But here's the idea, that we are one family. And, and we're not just one family who hangs out and has food together. We're not just one family who gathers to sing songs together. As Jesus says, we are one family who hears the word of God, and then what? What? Does. Do. What, what's the right verb here? I don't know. We do it. That's who God's family is. We hear it, and we do it. Now, it's instructive that Jesus gave this teaching at the end of a, a long, extended passage on listening and hearing and doing. He gives a parable, in fact. Jesus loves parables, right? He loves these stories. Images that, that point to a deeper meaning. So he says, a sower went out to sow seed. And as he's tossing seed along, and he says, and he translates it for his disciples later, Psst, the seed is the word of God. It's what God says. And ultimately, the word of God is Christ, right? When you boil it all down, what's God saying? Jesus. His Lord, His Savior, is all you need, right? Okay. So the word is going out. And he says, and here's how people listen. Some listen like a hard-packed path, which is to say the seed just kind of goes, blink, 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 it bounces, right? It doesn't get in, in other words, right? So those are the folks that are going, uh-huh, 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 I don't get it. And he says, it's like, you know, the birds come in, they eat the seed, they fly off, no change. He says, then there's some folks, and this is just what happens right here before, before what Jesus has said in, in Luke chapter 8. He says, there's some folks that are like, um, well, they're like rocky soil, you know, and you've walked down, a, say, a gravel path, and you see off to the edge where the dirt starts, there's a lot of gravel there, right? You don't tend to see a whole lot of crops growing there, and the reason Jesus says is because, you know, the seed falls there, and it gets in. It gets in. And, and people go, whoa, I get it, right? This is the folk that goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <gasps> The light bulb goes off, and he says, and they spring up quickly, and they say, yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, this is what I need. And then they fade. He says, they hear it, but as the sun beats down, because they have no root. You see, the seed gets in, but it doesn't get in far enough. It doesn't get into the heart, in other words. It gets into maybe the head. You know, Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And so when you wonder, you look at people and you say, I don't understand. I mean, yesterday you were so enthusiastic about Jesus and now you're walking away. I don't get it. Jesus says that's because there are some people that hear, but then it fades. And then he says, and then there's a third group of people. And this is the, this is the seed that goes out and it, it, it bounces off the, the hard pack, so through the rocks and into the thorny patch. Ugh. And he says, now, so the plant does grow. It does grow. And it, and it doesn't wither, but it sits there and never bears fruit. Why? Well, because the thorns, he says, are like the, the cares and the worries of life. 
And so this is like the person that's so consumed with the things of this world that though they have some agreement with the word, it doesn't bear fruit in their lives. He says, but for the one who hears the word of God, takes it into their heart, this person will bear fruit. And then he goes on to say, you can't hide a lamp forever. If the light is there, it's going to show. It's going to show. And then his mom and dad show up and they go, hey, Jesus. And he goes, hey, you know what, everybody? My true family are those who hear and who do. So of those first four groups, of those four groups that Jesus was listening, listening, how many of those does Jesus identify as his family? Just one. Just one. Just one. In Matthew, he says it this way. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my father and my sister and my mother. From which I, can, I conclude, Jesus can tell who's playing for his team. Jesus can tell. He tell. He knows. He looks at us and he says, I can tell who you are, and what does he say is the basis of his determination, who's his family and who's his not? Is it just those who listen? I'm sorry, is anybody listening? <laughs> is it just those who listen? Is it those who listen and nod? I agree, I agree, I agree. No, there's no such thing as a bobblehead Christian. It's those who listen and what? Do. But, but then the question becomes, well, now, wait a second. By grace you are saved through faith, and this is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Pastor, is Jesus contradicting Paul? Well, now let's just remember Paul came after Jesus, right? So what is it? What's the basis of our inclusion in the family? Well, it is the faith. But here's the thing about faith, as James says. Faith without works in faith at all. Faith without works, he says, is dead. How do you know when the faith is real? How do you know when the faith is true? How do you know when a person has genuinely been born again as a member of the family of God? John tells us, it's my Father's will that you bear much fruit. And any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, it's tossed into the fire. I, I bring this up because two weeks ago, I got an email from a young man who grew up under my ministry in New York. He's 27 now, I think. Super bright. I mean, he's a commercial pilot now, which I have to say, when I first met him, he was 14. So the idea of that 14-year-old flying my plane sends shivers down my spine. But he's 27 now, and he's a commercial pilot. But he's got such a baby face, I tell you what, if you walked on the plane, you'd be like, what's this little boy doing driving this plane? Yeah, okay, but he's super bright, he's a young man, he's married, and um, I can't remember, they're living in, I can't remember, he's living near one of the, uh, the major commercial uh, airline, uh, um, um, what do you call them? Hubs, thank you. Anyway, so he emails me, he says, Pastor, I'm very disturbed. I have a friend, you see, whose pastor just preached a nine-part series on eternal security. And eternal security, the doctrine that once you have come to Christ and, and are truly God's, you will never be cast away by God. And I said, okay, great, great, great. And he said to me, but my friend is saying that this pastor says that those who believe, right, are justified, right, and that if they stop believing and say no to Jesus, and walk away from Jesus, and say, Jesus, I never knew you, and I don't want anything to do with you, in other words, apostates, that they're okay. They're okay with God. And I said, well, what do you mean he said that they're okay with God? I mean, we got, we got Judas as our classic example. Is he saying that Judas is, is all right, right? Judas, the, the son of destruction, the one doomed to eternal... Uh, I don't think so. He says, well, but, but the pastor is teaching that if you believe that God says, that's good enough, not your head, bobblehead, right? And you're in. And therefore you can do, he says, 
anything after that point, and you're in. And I thought to myself, where did this come from? I mean, I've heard once saved, always saved, and that is true. But the only way you can tell who the true followers are. I mean, didn't Jesus say, on that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, 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 did we not? Did we not? And he'll say, I never knew you. Away from me, you who work iniquity. So I said to this young man, I think this pastor has taken his doctrine and is cramming it down the Bible's throat instead of letting the scriptures speak. You see, if we're really on Team Jesus, then we wear the gear, right? I got the mark of Jesus on me, the name of Jesus. I, I, I'm playing for Jesus, am I? Yes? I'm not playing for the other side. Regardless of whatever I might have said or whatever I nodded to or if I were even baptized or prayed a prayer at some point, Jesus is saying my family is made up of the people who hear and then do. That's my family. It's not the works that save. It's the works that reveal who belongs on the team. Imagine. Imagine a player on a team wearing the other team's jersey. And every time the ball is hiked, he tackles his fellow teammates. And he goes, hey, 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 but I play for this team, all right? Imagine, as this pastor is saying, a player on a team who wants the scholarship to go to the school and who says, I hate the school, I'm never going to play for this team, don't you put me out on the field, I don't even like football, but I expect a scholarship. Can you imagine such a thing? It defies reason. You can tell who the team is by what they do. So what do we do? Well, we play on Jesus' team, don't we? And I've shared with you over the last four weeks, this is how we play. We seek God. And we seek those who are seeking God. If you're looking to find the one true God, oh boy, we're looking for you. And let us help you find your way to the... I'm nobody. I'm just the guy they pay to stand up here with a microphone and point people to Jesus. But then once we find Jesus, as the scriptures command us, we say, well, I'm not content to be a newborn babe. And nor am I content to say, well, now that I got mine, <laughs> eternal life in my pocket, I can do whatever I want. That's no good. Now we grow. And how do we grow? Well, we we grow together. We learn God's word and we seek to apply it to our lives. Why would we do any different when we're on his team? And then we gather to worship. And some folks have said it's worship to walk along the path out there in creation and to look up at the sky and to say what a beautiful God we serve. And it is. It is, of course. But the worship of God is for the people of God. So we gather for worship. When Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, which is to say for worship, right, that I'm there. And he says, don't forsake the gathering. And it's been tough during this pandemic, which is why we've got a digital gathering going, hey, out there in digital land. Because we gather for worship. Because this is what God's people do. It's what marks us off as a part of his team. And then, and then, and then, we say, oh boy, I'm looking out at this world and I'm looking for the people that are looking for God, but some of them are not very nice. <laughs> how are we going to handle them? Well, we're going to care for them, aren't we? Because this is how Jesus cares for the hurting. He loves them. So we're going we're gonna to seek, and we're going to grow, and we're going to worship, and we're going to care, and we're going to do it as a team. We're going to do it as a family. We're going to do it, as Paul says, like a body, let's say. Just as one body, he says, just as a body, though one has many parts. Look at all these parts. But all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and that includes everybody under the sun. 
and we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now you, you, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. There are only three metaphors that I'm aware of in Scripture in the New Testament that are given to describe the church. Metaphors. The first is family, right? This is why Jesus says, I'm going to tell you who my family is. They're the folks who hear my word, hear the word of God, and do it. Paul's just given us the second one. What does Paul say the church is like? A body, right? And he goes, how does a body work? You got, you got two hands. One, two. And two eyes and two ears, right? Who's got the head? I mean, who's got the head? Jesus. Jesus has got the head. He's the head, and we're the rest. And where the head points, the body goes, right? And so that's what he says. What's the third? Anybody know the third metaphor? This is not, this is not required uh, for an A on today's exam. But anybody know the third metaphor? Bride. Thank you, Nancy. Well done. It's a wonderful bride here for Lee. Yes. Yes, so you got, you got a bride. How many brides? How many, how many brides will there be in heaven? One bride, and we're it, all right? So there you go. A family works together. A body, if it doesn't work, you're in the hospital. And a bride, if she's not ready to walk down that aisle, you think the groom wants her? But no, here we are, you and I, as a part of this one body. And I was reminded of this this week when I went and uh, spent a little time with our widows. Our widows ministry not all the widows were able to be there but i spent some time with uh the widows ministry they had a luncheon this past thursday their second one back they're they're like hey pandemic's over as far as i'm concerned and we're getting together and there were 30 women and pastor wayne <laughs> and he was giving the talk and i came in and i sat for a few minutes and i looked around and i said look at these look at these beautiful body parts <laughs> look at these beautiful parts of the body of christ all these women in this room, and they have, they have two leaders. They have Faith Snow, and they have Diane Padgett. And then they have all these widow sponsors. And the widow sponsors are the ones that call the widows and say, Hey, how are you doing? Oh, oh, uh, what's going on with your family? Oh, how, how are things? And they gather, and they get together. But you see, the gathering, and they get, that's just the, the sauce, right? It's the fact that they know each other, and they love each other, and they're seeking Christ. And we even sang Rock of Ages. I got to play, and they got to sing. We worshiped together and then they sang some more after I had to leave and and I'm like this is how the body works this is it seeking and growing and worshiping and caring and together and while I was there Pastor Wayne announced hey we're starting up the senior adult ministry and he said we're not just getting together for food <laughs> I mean we will have food he said <laughs> But he says, no, we have a leader. And he's told me this. We have a leadership team. And this leadership team is very, very purposeful. They don't want to just do trips and fun and head here and head there. I mean, they want to do some of that. But what they want to do is they want to stay connected. They want to seek. They want to grow. They want to worship. And they want to care. And I thought, this is how it's done. This is the body of Christ. And then I was thinking about, you know, how did all this get started? And I thought to myself, well, you know, Morningside is, as Butch said in his testimony, a friendly church, a welcoming church. And I thought about our connecting ministry. Julianne Crane's our connecting ministry director. And how they, they put, the, they put the, you know, the, the best uh, show out. I would say show. I mean, when you walk in, who's there to greet you on the way in? Smiling faces welcoming faces we're so glad you're here faces and handshakes or fist bumps as the case may be and I thought yes that's what this church is all about it's about welcoming people to Christ bringing people to Christ and then making them a part of this family and then I thought you know what and it is a family when you think about it I mean we've got we've got kids and we've got students, we've got young adults, and this is all a part of our next-gen ministry. And I thought about what a, what a beautiful thing how the, the folks that are a little more seasoned in years are, are giving money to this Freely campaign down here to make a more suitable space 
for our next gen. And how many leaders we have under, under Pastor Zach and under uh, Zach Walsh who are, who are discipling our children and our students, our college students who are away because it's a holiday weekend, three-day weekend, woo -hoo. And, uh, but they're faithfully serving and ministering to the next generation because let's face it, I'm not going to be here forever. You're not going to be. We got to pass it on. And that's what they're doing for the next generation. Uh, and, and I thought about, well, and they're not the only ones. I mean, we have faithful, dedicated disciplers here in this church. Bible fell. It used to be called Sunday school, right? Who remembers Sunday school? Well, yeah, that was what it was always called for me. But now it's called Bible Fellowship. Fine, that's fine. All right, but that's what they're doing. And Sunday morning in and Sunday morning out, they meet and prepare and they share and they invite. And they, so they're seeking and they're growing. And, and I'm sure all the Bible Fellowship teachers are saying, now come to worship with me. And, and they're caring about their people. Most of the time when I hear that there's a hurting member in our church, a hurting person in our church, it's from a Bible Fellowship leader. Because they know. And so you've got adult discipleship with small groups and with Bible. Fellowship. We've got men's ministry and women's ministry. And the whole purpose of these groups and the whole purpose that these leaders are set out to do is to be the church. Not to be many little churches, God forbid. We don't want to be going in different directions. But to be the one body of Christ, the one team Jesus. Well, you know, and it doesn't stop there, does it? I mean, this, this morning is another team. They were up here. And none of you wanted to be up here because <laughs> you knew we were all better off with them being up here <laughs> leading us in worship. And they were. And there's even new faces up here. You saw some new faces occasionally. And there's young faces and less young faces up here. And they're leading us and they prepare week in and week out to come before God and before you and to say welcome to Morningside let's worship Jesus and this team is leading and then we'll forget about it we've had our missions team has been out here every week saying hey we can't just leave the gospel here at the doors when we leave they're saying come on choose one come on sign up let's get to work out in the world and this is a team of people that are saying how can we best meet the needs of the lost people in our community and they don't even get me started on the elders. I mean, these, these guys are meeting and praying and, and yearning for the spirit of Christ to be made whole and perfect in you and our deacons who care about what's going on in your life and in your family. And I think, I step back and I go, wow. God is building his church. There's a team of people here. And you're part of it. And I'm a part of it. And pandemic or no, Christ is building his church here at Morningside, putting this team together. And you're here today. And you worship the same Lord and Savior I did. And you recalled the same gift having received it as I recalled as we sing with a beautiful name. Death cannot hold you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. You have no rival. <laughs> Yours is the kingdom and the glory forever. You're a part of Team Jesus, if that was your worship this morning. So whether you're a part of one of these leadership teams, whether you're actively discipling someone else, whether you're on this live stream this morning or here in this room, you, if you know Christ, are a part of Team Jesus. And so I invite you uh, to take some swag. Uh, Julian, would you come down if you've got some helpers? Uh, bring, on, bring your helpers down. we got some swag for you here. And now those of you over the age of 35 may not know what swag is. Uh, would you hand me, I think there's a little magnet there sitting there, Pauline, can you see it? Yeah, could you bring that up to me? So, all right, so, you know, we're, we're not into big displays, big shows, but we do have for you a little puzzle piece magnet. And this puzzle piece magnet says, I'm a part of Morningside Baptist Church. And this is for your fridge, all right? So this is the kind of swag that's just going to, you know, uh, remind you when you are in your house, Hey, that's right. 
I'm a part, and it's a puzzle piece because, you know, <laughs> you never had a puzzle with just one piece, right? You have a lot of pieces, and when you put them all together, they make a picture. And this right here is the picture. So if you're a part of Morningside, whether I mentioned a ministry that you lead in, whether I mentioned a ministry that you're a part of, whether you're just here and you're just worshiping today and you count yourself, whether you're a member or an attendee, it doesn't matter. If you're a part of Morningside Baptist Church, then come on up and get a magnet. Phil's got some magnets here. Julianne's got some magnets. Jill's got some magnets. Come on down, grab your swag and take it home and stick it on your fridge. If you say, well, do we need one for his fridge and her fridge? If you've got two fridges in your home, sure. All right. But, but come down and get your magnet. And we're hoping this magnet sticks to your fridge. Now, for those of you on the live stream, you say, well, I can't get a magnet. Yes, you can. Take a look at your screen, those of you on the live stream right now, and you see the email address of Julianne Crane, our Connections Ministry Director. And all you need to do is send a quick email to Julianne Crane with your mailing address and say, I want a magnet. Please send me a magnet. So give us your name and your mailing address, and Julianne will be happy to mail you a magnet for you to stick on your fridge and to say, I'm a part of Team Jesus at Morningside. Now, those of you in the balcony, it's a little bit further trek from there to here, but you're welcome to make the trek. You've got to come down at some point anyway. So, I mean, you can come on down and get your magnet. If you say, well, I don't want to until later, that's all right, too. This is not a one-time offer. Now, I, myself, I, myself, I'm just a part. I'm just a part. I'm not even the, the main part. <laughs> I'm not even the head. I'm not even the mouth. He is, Jesus is, but I'm a part of his team. And if you know Christ whether you count yourself part of Morningside or not, you are a part of Team Jesus. All we've said here is, yes, I'm a part of the team of Jesus that seeks, that grows, that worships, that cares, and that works as one at Morningside. <laughs> That's who I am. That's who you are. That's what you've said this morning. And I'm just going to say, you know, um, Paul talks about parts. You know, he talks about the more honorable parts, the less. Okay, that's not the point. The point is that there is nobody in your family that you think to yourself, gee, I sure wish this person weren't in my family. At least I hope you don't wish that. There may be some members of your family that you wish would be a little closer to you, a little closer to the Lord. But none of the members of your family ever stop being members of your family if they're truly a part of your family. And I want you to know that these last 18, 19, 20 months have been very, very difficult for the family of God, not just here at Morningside, but everywhere, everywhere. So what we do when we come back to our purposes is we remind ourselves, this is what God has said, this is what He wants us to do, and oh, by the way, that's how we mark ourselves as His family. We take His Word, and we do it as a family. His brothers and sisters, the children of God in this world. And until he brings us home, which, you know, I'm not looking for it to happen anytime soon, but I am looking for Jesus to return soon, and I'm hoping he doesn't delay. But until he returns or until he calls us home, we're it. We're it. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ and the body of Christ, the family of Christ, the bride of Christ is us. <laughs> so, yes, the hope of the world is Christ in you. Working out God's purposes in this world. And I hope you count yourself apart. Let's pray. Father, thank you for making us one. <laughs> you made us one family and you told us this is how you know 
who's on my team, who's part of my family. And Lord Jesus, I am blessed. We are blessed to be part of your family. By faith, according to your grace, and that faith that you have given to us that we are working out with fear and trembling, as Paul says, we work out by doing. Doing all you've called us to do. To seek, to grow, to worship, to care, love, the hurting, and to do it like we're family. Thank you for my family. These these spiritual family members that I get to serve with, that I'm so blessed to watch as they seek and grow and worship and care for one another and for a lost world. Thank you for those with gifts who step forward and say, sure, I'll help build a team. I'll help lead a team. But thank you, Father, that none of those folks are saying, my team, (laughs) my church, my way. They're all of them saying, Lord Jesus, this is your body. We are your church. God, we are your family, and we will get to work doing your one will in Christ Jesus. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus, for my family. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you.